Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambutasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambutasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambutasa. Buddhang damang sanghang namasam. All right, good morning, everybody. And we are embarking on a day of practice, yeah? Whatever this means for you. And again, it's not totally under our control, right? And this is actually what makes it practice. <laughs> if things went exactly like we planned, we wouldn't have to practice. But as it turns out, we are practicing for life, yeah? Whatever is going to happen today is going to happen, and it's up to you to sort of receive it and to culti continue cultivating all of the good and wise mental qualities that you've you've been cultivating on this path. And that is, Bob and I always say, development in this path. And today there was uh, the suggestion that we take a look at views. Take a and. Um, in so many ways, uh, you know, when we open the Pali Canon to a section on views and we start reading through all the various metaphysical views that people were holding at the time of the Buddha, and we're like, what is, what am I supposed to do with this again? <laughs> you know, it seems like the subject of views is sort of like the rocks on the beach that are, are the waves of our mind crash against over and over again and don't even make a dent. You know, uh, but uh, still, I think over time, this is one of the most important subjects for us to attend to. Actually, one of the most fundamental um, subjects in terms of what uh, what enlightenment actually does. Uh, but it's also it's surprisingly subtle and um, beyond the scope of our normal way of thinking of things. In fact, it almost demands that we set down all of the stuff we usually concern ourselves with and try to, you know, broaden our scope to, to look at something that we can't actually see, which is our views. This is the invisible sort of uh, framework that is pointing our mind in certain directions, that is contextualizing uh, or framing the things that we do in the world, which we, we know and we can see. It's our views that cause our conflicts. It's our views that keep us locked into an obsession. Yeah. And they don't seem to give way easily. As much as we know we're not supposed to have them, we're not supposed to stick to them, they're not supposed to be permanent, we get shocked. If somebody says something and we're like, you're, you're, you're wrong. <laughs> and we're like, why am I, why do I feel like you're wrong? Why am I so sure that you're wrong? I'm not supposed to have these views. We don't know. Yeah? It's it's so far back. It's so subtle. It's so fundamental that this practice um, asks that we really turn and, and, and look at it and almost walk into these views to feel the discomfort that comes from them and through that come to understand why they why they are a problem yeah so i thought um it's always nice to start with the words of the buddha and um so the theme of the day was ditasava which is um the outflow the corruption the pollution of views and um we have a sutta that uses the word asava in the majjhima nikaya it is majjhima nikaya number two called the Sambhasava Sutta, or All of the Outflows. And um, there is a section here that deals with, with views. It actually mentions, uh, in the Pali Canon, we, we have a list of three asavas, three outflows. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, discuss more about asava in a second. But we have the outflow of sensuality, we have the outflow of becoming, and we have the outflow of ignorance. And we see those in the sutta. Often, though, uh, I'm not sure if the Buddha says it, it probably does somewhere, but definitely in the commentaries, they add in a fourth outflow, which is actually the first one, 
the, the beginning one in terms of the ones that fall away is the outflow of views. And this is Dittasava. And so in the sutta, we see the three views are named, the three uh, outflows are named, but then views are given a very prominent space right after them. And this is part of why they're added to this list. And I will um, just read a little of this here to kind of set the stage so you can take a deep breath, breathe out, listen to the words of the Buddha. This is the section of defilements to be given up by seeing. And what are the defilements that should be given up by seeing? Take an unlearned ordinary person who has not seen the noble ones and is neither skilled nor trained in the teaching of the noble ones. They haven't seen true persons and are neither skilled nor trained in the teaching of good of true persons. They don't understand to which things they should apply the mind and to which things they should not apply the mind. So they apply their mind to things they shouldn't and they don't apply their mind to things they should. What are the things to which they apply the mind but should not? They are things that, when the mind is applied to them, give rise to unarisen defilements and make arisen defilements grow. The defilements of sensual desire, the desire for becoming, and the desire for ignorance. These are the things to which they apply the mind but should not. And what are the things to which they do not apply the mind but should? There are things that, when the mind is applied to them, do not give rise to unarisen defilements and give up arisen defilements. They give up the defilements of sensual desire, desire to be reborn in ignorance. These are the things to which they do not apply the mind that they should. Because of applying the mind to what they should not and not applying the mind to what they should, unarisen defilements arise and arisen defilements grow. And then the Buddha gives a list which we've probably seen these lists of uh, a lot of various ways that people could form a view about were they in the past or what will they be in the future? Do they exist? Do they not exist? Is the universe finite or infinite? Do I have a self or a not self? We're going to skip that part right now just for the sake of, yeah, we'll get to that this afternoon. <laughs> but it, after listing these views, he says, this is called a mis misconception, the thicket of views, the desert of views, the twist of views, the dodge of views, the fetter of views. An unlearned ordinary person who is fettered by views is not freed from rebirth, old age and death, from sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness and distress. They are not freed from suffering, I say. And then um, he talks about the instructed noble disciple applies their mind to not these views. And he says, because of not applying the mind to what they should not and applying the mind to what they should, unarisen defilements don't arise and arisen defilements are given up. They rationally apply their mind. This is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. And this is the practice that leads to the cessation of suffering. And as they do so, they give up three fetters, personality view, doubt, and misapprehension of precepts and, and observances. These are called the defilements that should be given up by seeing. Okay, and again, that's Majjhima Nikaya too, if you wanna go take a look. It's a very, uh, it's a very broad, important sutta. And it doesn't take this normal structure that we see in the Majjhima Nikaya of the gradual training. It doesn't say, okay, well, first sit down, <laughs> practice morality, you know, practice renunciation, you know, practice mindfulness, develop samadhi, get the psychic powers, see your past births, get enlightened. No, it just says, look, you've got all of this, this big bag of defilements. Some of them you, you avoid, some of them you restrain, some of them you need wisdom and the proper application of your mind to overcome. And views are like this. And the reward for being willing to take a look at views and to understand them and overcome the attachment to them is stream entry, the freedom from the first three fetters, personality view, doubt about the teachings, and uh, rites and rituals or attachment to rites and rituals. 
Okay, so I carefully skirted around what makes talk on views the most confusing, right? Which is listing some of these views and asking ourselves, wait, I don't think that way. <laughs> so does this mean I'm free from them? <laughs> I don't worry about what I was in the past or what I'll be in the future or is the universe finite or infinite? <laughs> Who does that? No, when we look, most of our views are, are much more, they're much more in our, in our face. They're about things that we deal with every day. And when we know when we hit one, because we suffer and we get in arguments, yeah? Those, these are the views that we deal with, but there's no possible way the Buddha could list all of those views. So instead to learn how to deal with the views that we actually come in contact with, we have to understand what views are. Yeah, and that's, I thought that would be our framework for this morning, really just stepping back, broadening our scope and trying to figure out exactly what views are and what the problem is with views. Yeah, and it's even just decompressing a bit. And I think the thing with views is we really just want to see the suffering of them. Yeah? We really just want to be free of them. And when we really start to get this, we 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 see views like a snake in our path. And we like we just go around it. We don't go up to it and start poking it and be like, is this a poisonous snake or a non-poisonous snake? Is it a constrictor? You know, is it dangerous? Is it not dangerous? We We just walk around it. We just avoid it. And the same with all of these views. We don't need a list, any of them. We just find them as such a waste of time. Yeah, such a source of pain. But we have to, we have to work up to that. So let's, let's try to pull this apart. First off, what are we talking about? So uh, the word views is the word ditti. And Ditti shows up in the suttas a lot, yeah? And this is precisely because it's kind of right here at the beginning, but it's so essential um, to getting on the path, but also to what we do on the path. So what is, what is view? Well, it's not used in quite the way... Um, like the, the use of the word view in the English would be like the way we use for a view outside of a window. Like I have this view out the window of a yard. That's the view we're talking about. Um, it's not the word for um, like, a, you, know, you know, political views or religious views. It's the word for viewpoint. It's the word for perspective, right? It's closely tied with the notion of seeing. It is perspective, right? That's what a ditti is. A ditti is a perspective. And maybe we see, maybe we don't, but a perspective is kind of part of seeing. If you are seeing something, you have a perspective. Yeah? Because you're seeing it from a direction. Take take this pen. This pen is going to be our example, Dhamma. <laughs> I have a perspective from here to the pen. And I, this is, this is my ditti. Yeah, this is the way I see the pen. You have a completely 180 perspective on the pen. Your, your ditti about the pen is going to be informed from seeing the other side of it, the side I can't even see, right? So in ditti, we're, we're talking about um, seeing and a viewpoint that allows us to see. And I'll put a pin in that. We'll come back to ditti in a second. And now what is asava? And asava is a very clunky word that people have argued about for millennia, <laughs> right? Um, asava, yeah, it's kind of used for flowing, right? But we don't have to read the suttas very long to know that the Buddha was not pro asava. Like asavas were not a good thing. So it's not like a, a pleasant flow of water or a, a trickling stream, or you open your, your tap and water flows out. Now, asava is a bad flow, and how can a flow be bad? Well, some translators have rendered it as outflow. Some translators have rendered it as inflow, like the inflow of corruption. The way the word is used in the Pali language is like a sore that is exuding pus. <laughs> it's that kind of outflow. 
Uh, but it's also used for effluent or like um, garbage that is flowing into a stream, which, you know, again, if we're thinking back to the time of the Buddha, to ancient India, what, what did their words mean? Yeah, they meant stuff they could see, stuff that they could know and touch and smell in this case. So Asava is really talking about corruption. And I thought a good word is probably pollution. Yeah, because it's really describing what we're dealing with. Like an Asava is a pollution and specifically a pollution for the mind. So it doesn't really matter if we see it as an outflow or an inflow. It matters that we see that it corrupts. And so it's often um, called defilement, corruption, taint. And this is why, yeah? It is the addition of something that uh, makes the mind worse. Now, how is it, <laughs> we put these together, how is it a view could make the mind worse? How is it our perspective could make the mind worse? The simplest example of this is imagine we have a window and this window is open to a nice, beautiful, tranquil meadow. Well, this is not really polluting our view. It's not really polluting our mind, right? But what if this view was open to, I mean, a busy market street in the middle of the night with all of its flashing lights and, and chaos and cars coming and going? Then what came in through that view, through that viewpoint, through that window, would be light pollution. Yeah. What came in in terms of sound would be sound pollution, you know, honking and talking and all sorts of things going on. Yeah. And that's how views can pollute our mind. It really matters what we point our mind at and what inferences, what ideas we take from the place that we point our mind. And I say point our mind because we actually have a lot of control over where we point our minds, even though it's kind of invisible at the moment that we're, we're forming these standpoints and getting ready to fight with people about something. Uh, we had a choice, yeah? We chose to get in that situation by pointing our minds at a particular topic, yeah? So coming back to viewpoints, I understand that we, like we, we, in order to see something, we need a perspective. Seeing something <laughs> is not a problem, yeah? Just seeing something doesn't pollute the mind. It's when seeing is combined with something. And now this is where we're going to kind of zoom out and we're gonna get a bit more esoteric here. And I think it will actually help us this morning with looking at views to do that. Because in order to see how this works we have to really contemplate like well what what is going what is a view yeah in order to do that we have to kind of disconnect from the way we normally practice usually we're thinking about okay i'm going to sit i'm going to follow the breath i'm going to get nice and calm we've got to zoom way out yeah our views are the beginning of things and it deals with something um the buddha talks about as vision and knowledge yeah and if you've, if you've seen those words in the suttas, then you probably understand, wait, isn't that knowledge and vision? Isn't that when the Buddha says knowledge and vision of freedom, of liberation? Isn't that the end goal, to have knowledge and vision? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, we have knowledge and vision all the time. That's the thing. It's like that is the, that's how you describe the mind. It is knowledge and vision. The views that become problems are when we force these to try to be the same thing. And I will try to um, try to explain that, yeah? So say we have our Dhamma, yeah? <laughs> and say I have zero viewpoints on this Dhamma, then I have no knowledge of it. There's something here, but I haven't seen it, so I don't know it's there. Now say I have one viewpoint, suddenly I can see this, but this is a this is a three-dimensional object, yeah? I can only see it from one direction. So to me, it looks two-dimensional. Okay? So I'm not seeing the full object, but I'm seeing something. Now, at this point, I have both knowledge and vision of the object. I can see the object, and I also know that it's there. 
say I have two viewpoints. Well, now because of two viewpoints, I can see the object in three dimensions and I have a much better understanding of it and a much better knowledge of it. But say at this point, I go back to you know, zero viewpoints. I still have knowledge. And if you don't believe me, <laughs> you can test this for yourself. And it's very useful to do so, to understand that knowledge and vision are two different things. You can have them independently of each other. Now, my knowledge of the pen at this point is imprecise. Yeah, it could change. Somebody could dip it in orange paint, or they could you know, write something with it, or they could break it in half. I would not see that. I would not know that. My, my knowledge would not be completely inaccurate. It's, the pen still exists, yeah? So I do know something about the pen, and I just don't know its development. Now, the thing is, when I first saw it, maybe, what did I see? Well, I just saw a stick of plastic, right? I didn't really know it was a pen at first because all I saw was a shape. And so seeing can exist without knowledge. Right? Where we get into trouble is when we don't see that the two are independent. As soon as I see the pen, I start calling it a pen and I start saying it's for writing. But am I seeing it right? Am I seeing it full of ink? Am I seeing it clicky clicky? Am I seeing it in somebody's lapel pocket? Am I seeing it in an office somewhere ready to be used, a very useful object? No, all I'm seeing is a piece of plastic. The things that I know and the things that I see are different. And most of the time we function kind of juggling between these two aspects of our mind, knowing and seeing. And as long as we we can shift between them, and we don't get stuck on them, then there is no problem. And the thing is, viewpoints really need to flow, right? The problem with our viewpoints is we tend to decide, you know, this is the right viewpoint and we want it to be permanent. We want it to be sticky. We want it to be consistent and regular. And that, that is a problem because that's not how viewpoints work. <laughs> Our vision of the pen is really only useful if we're continuing to see the pen moving and changing and developing through time. Yeah. The moment that we stop doing that and we say like, well, no, that's what it is. And we focus in on just one vision of the pen, just one perspective of the pen. It's the same as not being able to see it at all, which is in effect what we've done. We have stopped seeing the subject change. Yeah, so our knowledge of it becomes imprecise again. Most of us don't get into arguments about pens. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, there, there's one that I think many of us find is, is funny, but is actually very much what we're going, what we do in the practice, yeah, so, have you heard this one that the earth is flat? You maybe you maybe heard this one. Yeah? The earth is the earth is flat. This is a perspective that some people take, and it is a very decent perspective. Yeah, if you're here on planet Earth and you're looking out in front of you, it seems that the earth is flat. You move a hundred miles to the west and you look around, it's still flat, right? Now some of you are like smirking at me. You're like. Really, from one particular viewpoint, this is right. But if you have a different viewpoint and you take a perspective from a, a satellite <laughs> looking down, you would say, the Earth is not flat. The Earth is a sphere. Obviously, you're wrong. <laughs> I'm right. You have two perspectives, <laughs> which gives you the sense that the Earth is a sphere. Say you had three perspectives and you could see the earth in four dimensions. Well, then the earth would not be flat. The earth would not be a sphere. The earth would be an island. Specifically, the earth would be an island on top of the back of the Milky Way, which would look like a giant turtle with its many legs 
you know, kind of paddling through the ocean of the cosmos alongside other giant turtles. And this was a view that many people had back in the day, a kind of four dimensional view of the, of the galaxy as a giant turtle with the earth on its back. Are they wrong? Well, I mean, it's not very practical to think of the earth in four dimensions, but who's wrong, who's right? And this is what you see, it's just a matter of what perspective you have. And this is where we get into trouble is deciding that only one perspective is right and the others are wrong. And for most of our views that we get in trouble with, where we even like we we lock it down to just two. Yeah. But often if we if we take a time to look, there's more than just two perspectives on a situation. Um, as long as I've been alive, there's been problems in the Middle East. So if I were to um, take one eyeball and and um, put it from an Israeli perspective, this these difficulties in the Middle East would be like this, right? Let's say I were to take the other eyeball and I were to put it from a Palestinian perspective. Well, then I would say, wow, okay, no, it's like this. What would happen, <laughs> like to my mind, if I had one eyeball of each? What would be my perspective on the situation? Yeah, what would be my views? Could I have views if my perspective was balanced out like that? But now you would say, well, okay, it would cancel each other out, right? There isn't just two perspectives on this. Say I were to add in a third Canadian eyeball. And I, that Canadian would have a much different perspective on what's going on in the Middle East. You'd see it from afar. Now, once upon a time, I was actually in a, in a public bath in Seoul, Korea, and they had the news on. And so I, I was just I was just sitting there in this kind of public hot bath and, you know, watching the news. And I realized that most of the things that are on American news weren't on Korean news and realizing that if you get far enough away, literally the other side of the planet, then you can't tell the difference between an Israeli and a Palestinian. They're they're, they're so tiny. <laughs> They're all, they all kind of blend together. You can't tell the difference between their cities or their cultures or their languages. And people in Korea really weren't talking about what was going on in the Middle East. It was so far away, it wasn't really relevant to what was going on. So if you add enough perspectives, anything that you could get a viewpoint about and get very upset about becomes just a wash of information. And that's kind of useful for what? Letting go, right? This is what we want to do. This is the process of letting go of views. We start by taking something that we have one perspective on, and it's fine that we have one perspective on, but if we find that there is an emotional charge dealing with this one perspective, then what we should do is imagine a different perspective. And this should show us that there are multiple ways of looking at this, that this is not two dimensional. It may be three or four or five or six dimensional, or it might have so many dimensions and facets that the only response that makes any sense is, oh, this, this is suffering. Yeah, it harmonizes it. It takes this multifaceted thing that we're not really sure what we know about the situation. And it, it, it brings us to the reality that, well, we can't really know anything permanent about the situation. That's not the function of perspective, really. What, what we can do is watch the situation, see the situation as it moves and evolves. And that's the closest we can get to actually knowing the situation. <clears throat> we have to be willing to take multiple perspectives and see it from multiple angles and never get stuck on one perspective, never get stuck on one angle. And so when the Buddha says that overcoming this pollution, this corruption, this attachment, this enslavement of views, leads to stream entry, 
this is exactly what happens. And the um, the phrase used, the, the insight, the explosive insight of a stream enter is all conditioned things are of the nature to cease. All that which arises is of the nature to cease. This is what they realize. And you're like, well, I get that. <laughs> yeah, no, everything's impermanent. I get it. I will, I will sign a contract that says, I hereby affirm that all things are impermanent. Does this mean I'm a stream enter? Well, <laughs> how do you deal with perspectives? How do you deal with views? How do you deal with beliefs? That is where the rubber hits the road. That is where the work is really done because that's the beginning of the problem. And when you do separate knowledge and vision, when you do accept that your knowledge of something is limited by your vision, is corrupted by your, your vision, and then also your, your vision is corrupted by your knowledge, and you let the two things be separate, and you let them flow, well, then you have what the Buddha calls knowledge and vision of liberation. And he's always, he usually slams them together because that's what they did in Pali, and it's the Yanadasana, knowledge and vision. But he's saying them both. He's not saying you get, you know, super knowledge, supervision, and that combines them. No, you get knowledge and vision. The, the end product is that you realize that there is no person, there is no stable, verifiable, right place to be. That in order to be right, which is the right that we find in the Noble Eightfold Path, you have to be able to flow. You have to take multiple positions and you have to take multiple perspectives and keep doing that and never get stuck. Let your knowledge develop, let your vision develop. Have one perspective today, one perspective tomorrow, it doesn't matter. Maybe you keep arriving at the same conclusions about it because you see it and it seems to be this way. It doesn't matter as long as you're open to the possibility that there is more information that you're not seeing and that you could see it from a different perspective or it could change. So this is, um, if you're up for it, this is kind of the exercise of the morning. And a, a lot of this should lead you to the same place. If you do this even once, you're probably going to, to realize that views are just a pain in the ass. So try it. <laughs> take, take something you have a perspective on and invent a different perspective. And it doesn't even have to be an opposite perspective, just a different one, yeah? If your neighbor built a fence and it seems to be on your property <laughs> and your perspective is they're wrong, well then just hop over to your, to your neighbor's yard and look at it and see if their perspective changes the scenario, yeah? Maybe there's, there's no good place to put it or require chopping down a tree, so then they put it on your, but then go over across the street <laughs> to, to, to somebody in the neighborhood, yeah? and look at it from their perspective. Who cares? <laughs> it's the difference of five feet where that fence is. Why would you get upset about that? That's also a perfectly valid perspective. Now jump over to the county board, <laughs> the planning commission, <laughs> and everybody's wrong and everybody's gonna get fined. And this is also a perspective, right? Now you should see as you start to tease this out and have multiple perspectives is that you don't wanna take any of them. They all feel like they will lead to conflict and then you get it. <laughs> Having a, a concrete, stable perspective is a recipe for suffering. Yeah, there is no one right, there is no one wrong. Even when it comes to something that seems obvious, like is the earth a sphere or is it flat? Or is it on the back of a giant turtle? It seems obvious, but that's just because of your perspective. So take a trip, take a trip out into the cosmos and just let it be something different for a little while. And then look back and see your old viewpoint that no, it's definitely a sphere or it's definitely flat or it's definitely on a turtle. And see if you want to go back to that view, which is view as, as a, a viewpoint, a standpoint, a permanent 
fixation. Yeah? You won't. If you have any wisdom at all, you won't. It'll seem like a really bad idea from that perspective. And this is how we get outside of our own suffering. And it's once we get outside of our own suffering, that's where we can come to know the knowledge and vision of liberation, which is knowledge liberated from vision and vision liberated from knowledge. And we can just let things be. Okay. So very simple. You can choose, choose whatever view you want to look at. And then if it brings you to a place of peace and not wanting views, hang out. <laughs> Trust me, that's where you want to be. <laughs> Yeah, I'll make that your zip code. All right, and we will continue. Um, we will sit and walk at, and we go until noon Eastern time. Is that right? Or is it 11? You all didn't immediately nod. Will somebody tell me? Noon. Noon, okay. Uh, great. So um, we'll, we'll sit and walk, the, the room will stay open. And at noon we'll break for lunch. There won't be any interviews um, on this particular retreat. I'll have to pop out and do some of my duties, but then we'll come back at 2 p.m. and we'll begin the afternoon session.